Uh, now, with a reading from uh, the Gospel according to Mark, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water... He saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will bless the Lord at all times. Let his praise be continually in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let us pray, Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you. In the name of the resurrected Christ, who is our rock and our redeemer, amen. amen. The title of this sermon and this service is Prepare Ye the Way, because, according to my parents, my preaching and teaching career actually began at a very, very young age. We had gone to see the musical Godspell in the theater. You may be familiar with this 1970s rock and roll rendition of the gospel. And as we sat in the audience that night, I was ready for the opening of this play, which involves John the Baptist coming forward for the invocation, the epic and beautiful refrain, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Thank you, Lydia, for, for playing that for us tonight. And as the people in the theater sat quiet, and John the Baptist started to sing, an eager young child interrupted the proceedings and shouted at the top of his lungs, That song is on our record! <laughs> and according to my daddy's retelling, the entire cast joined the audience in stunned laughter at my spontaneous disruption. <laughs> so at age four, thus began my preaching career. Now, each Monday afternoon before I go to seminary at Vanderbilt, I drive about 80 minutes each way in the car from Cookville, Tennessee, down Interstate 40. I see John the Baptist in the billboard that stares down at me and asks, if you died today, where would you spend eternity? And then as I arrive at the exit ramp to Broadway, downtown Nashville, I see the same man every week. He's selling a little street sheet called The Contributor, and he's hearkening us to prepare the way for new perspectives on homelessness and homeless folk. Now, it's in the news, and I'm sure you are all aware that all across America today, from from California to New York, from Asheville, North Carolina, to Nashville, Tennessee, and even one Saturday with Troy and Hannah and me on the square of Cookville, Tennessee, there is this Occupy movement that's going on. They're saying, Occupy in the name of the poor and the unemployed and the disenfranchised. See, in their signs and placards and concrete campgrounds, I see John the Baptist proclaiming, Prepare ye the way for peace, prepare ye the way for hope, prepare ye the way for justice. For now more than ever, we need to prepare ye the way for the Lord of the poor, the prince of the peasants who comes to town on a donkey to confront the powers that be in, oh, an occupied Jerusalem parade. 
If we quiet our hearts long enough to hear the world groaning and moaning for change, we can hear the voice of John the Baptist. And just then as now, he's issuing an eloquent yet shrill call for collective and relational repentance from within the asphalt arteries and alienated cubicles of the American cultural wilderness. Jesus needs John the Baptist. We need John the Baptist. Mark tips us off to the revolutionary implications of the relationship between John and Jesus, Jesus and John. As a matter of fact, I'll go so far as to say that we don't have a Christ or a Christology without first working through and with John the Baptist. Marcus Borg suggests that John was actually a teacher and a mentor to Jesus. Perhaps Christ followed John to a sort of wilderness training camp to have his call clarified, his mission honed, his ministry discerned. See, we don't have a good God movement without a recruiter, without an instigator and an agitator. That's the beatifically brash and rhetorically harsh harbinger we find in this passage with John the Baptist. I'll call him the carnival barker of the Jesus movement. This wild man wearing a cloak of camel's hair, uh, warning the rich and powerful to repent. Jesus needs John the Baptist. I mean, let me break it down for you. Jesus needs John the Baptist like the Beatles need Elvis Presley. Jesus needs John the Baptist like Elvis Presley needs Sister Rosetta Tharp. Jesus needs John the Baptist like Eric Clapton needs Muddy Waters. Jesus needs John the Baptist like Martin Luther King needs Mahatma Gandhi, like Martin Luther King needs Rosa Parks. Every good movement needs instigators and agitators to energize, to prepare ye the way. So we are called to be John in order to know Jesus. If we don't prepare ye the way, we cannot bring the kingdom come. According to radical theologian Chad Myers, this passage is an induction ceremony into the movement for Jesus. This is not like our baptisms in some churches today where baptism might be more like joining an elite country club of the frozen chosen. This is joining a movement of resistance and revolution. Just This is joining the rank and file of the God movement. And this is the beginning of the story of Christ. Not with cozy niceties of our Christmas cards and Christmas carols. No scrubbed up nativity narratives of made for TV specials. But no, the beckoning baptizer asking us to repent. Repent meaning more than confess your dirty deeds that were done dirt cheap. But repent meaning change your heart and your mind, and turn your life around. Repent, meaning transform sin consciousness into God consciousness, selfish consciousness into selfless consciousness. In other words, free your mind and the rest will follow. Not only does Christ's baptism induct him into a revolutionary subculture of the God movement, but Mark's gospel marks Christ as one of us and embeds him in the fabric of all of creation as a card-carrying member of a cosmic community, our inclusive web of an harmonic infinity. See, Jesus, in this passage, submits to being more like us, and we need to submit to being more like Jesus. My own baptism took place in the inner city of Chicago, in early 1968 at a place called the Church of the Three Crosses, part of an urban movement of the emerging church in 1968. And just months after my baptism in early 1968, the clergy, the ministers of my church, and the lay leaders would take a large wooden cross out of our sanctuary into the streets and over to Lincoln Park, where they tried to prayerfully and peacefully mediate with this cross the conflict between the police and the protesters outside the Democratic National Convention. You might have heard on the news back then that they were unsuccessful in bringing the peace as the police beat the mostly unarmed protesters. Just in the last couple of weeks, ministers in Portland, Oregon, I know, went down to the Occupy Portland movement and tried to do the same thing, to stand as a voice of peace, clergy as a voice of peace in these <coughs> occupations that are going on. During that process, the large wooden cross from the sanctuary at the Church of the Three Crosses was lost in the melee in the park. And some church members criticized this action. But many members of that congregation saw that this was the call to take this cross, 
symbolizing a sacred inner relationship between the secular and the sacred and bringing it into the park. That was just an extension of Sunday morning. So just like today, like then, we are, some of us, called to protest, and people have joined the Occupy movement from the religious community. The drastic economic difference between the 1 and 99% was explained by one commentator as actually the 99.8% and the 0.02%. And so I think it would be tempting for some of us to, to think like the prophet Isaiah and to um, think like Jesus in the turning over the tables with the money changers, or to think like another Advent story in Mary in the Mag Magnificat, and to say, let's fill the 99% with w good things and send the 1% away empty. But I think that God would correct our math and square it with God's morality. Christ's unconditional and radically inclusive love sees how reconciliation to truly be revolutionary includes the powers that be and the powerful that can't see, making no percentage but 100%. For even the powerful can experience powerlessness in the presence of God, and might be empowered by relinquishing the power that harms in favor of a power that heals. So, I believe that we are called to be John in order to know Jesus. And we do want to prepare ye the way. But if I admit it, some days I just don't want to do the work. I don't want to lose my first world creature comforts. Many of us don't want to go into a real or imagined wilderness with Shane Claiborne who suggests we purge ourselves of empire. We don't want to join John the Baptist at a radical wilderness training camp or hang out with men in wild clothing who eat foraged food. I admit for Advent I don't even want to take a fast from my Facebook account. <laughs> but God grant us the serenity to accept the fact that we might not change the world and the courage to try anyway God grant us the courage to prepare you the way because somewhere right now Chris addicts and alcoholics are getting clean and sober and are preparing the way to restoring their lives somewhere right now divorcees are getting counseled and are preparing the way to reclaiming their lives somewhere right now the victims and the veterans are getting comforted and are preparing the way to rebuilding their lives somewhere right now underpaid and underemployed workers are getting organized and are preparing the way for fighting for their lives somewhere right now to be baptized is not to privatize your salvation. Don't rationalize or believe the lies for in the God, man, Jesus, divinity gets democratized. And we, Christ's body, the church, we make this work collectivized. To repent is to realize and accept God's surprise that the redeemed will self-actualize. Keep your eyes on the prize. Jesus will submit to be baptized in the dirty water of the Jordan River, but from that water as from a tomb, he will also rise, and he will see him with his very eyes. A song, can't no grave, hold my body down. Somewhere right now, someplace like right here, in little old Cookville, we are experiencing a revival of the revolutionary spirit of the New Testament. For when we submit to Jesus, we submit to others. When we empower a voice in the wilderness against power and for peace and economic justice, we bring John the Baptist. When we repent, we change our attitude and use our gratitude to help change the lives of others. And then Advent. Advent awaits us. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Prepare you the way. Amen.